So hi, Alex. Uh, thank you for joining me today and welcome to the Shiki Science Show. Thank you for having me. This is great. And uh, congratulations is in order because you've got a first author came out at Nature Aging recently, which we're going to be talking about today, which is like super impressive and exciting. Yeah, so, so huge congratulations there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I guess a kind of important uh, kind of background to cover before we go into depth about this paper is could you try and explain to us what biological age is and how that might compare to chronological age? It's a difficult question. Uh, I think there's still a lot of uncertainty about what the term biological age uh, really means. Um, and there's a lot of disagreement uh, in the longevity community about that. Um, I think generally it's, it's believed to be a metric that's more reflective of the inherent fitness of an organism or of a tissue or a cell, uh, as opposed to uh, just chronological age, which is literally a measure of how many times you've gone around the sun um, along with spaceship Earth. So um, yeah, I think Generally in longevity, people are trying to, to find mechanisms and, and tools to, to measure what they believe is biological age, or at least some correlative metric uh, to biological age, uh, to really understand how organisms age and how we can eventually rejuvenate um, tissues and cells and hopefully organisms as a whole too. Yeah, so there's different ways of actually trying to uh, do different biomarkers to predict biological age, but the one that is of relevance to your publication is epigenetic aging. So could you explain exactly what that is and what kind of biomarkers you're looking at to, to do this? Sure. So um, epigenetic age first, um, it was kind of the, the idea first circulated uh, by Steve Horvath in 2011 and then in 2013 with um, the big paper that he wrote in Genome Biology. And the idea is that you can track changes in the epigenome and particularly in DNA methylation. And a lot of these uh, CPG sites, as they're called, uh, have um, not all, but some have um, interesting relationships with age. So some will increase in methylation um, pretty robustly with age. Some will decrease in methylation. Some will, most will not change at all. Most are totally unrelated to aging, but a small subset of these CPG sites um, do have a relationship with age. And so we can use those uh, essentially, and that's what Steve Horvath did in his 2013 paper to create these um, uh, machine learning models um, that eventually allow you to predict whether it's chronological or biological age, it's still tough to say, but some, some metric that is reflective of, of the age based on the epigenome. So currently these methods or like these approaches using DNA methylation, they use so-called uh, bulk samples but your publication talks about using single cells and measuring the age of a single cell. Um, and so what's like the major difference between the two and what are the limitations of trying to, to predict the age of a single cell? Yeah, so as you said, most methods uh, ever since 2013, they've all relied on bulk samples. And the idea is that you can get the, the methylome of a bulk sample. And since there's a lot of, you have a lot of cells, you'll get a lot of DNA. And that enables you to get uh, fractional um, methylation fractions for each CPG site. And the other advantage is that since you have so many cells and so much DNA, you're going to get very consistent coverage of CPG sites between samples. And so you can make these nice matrices um, that have CPGs on the, as columns or as, as rows, and then samples as columns or rows, whatever you want to do. Uh, and it'll be very consistent across samples. And you can use those uh, directly for machine learning approaches like elastic net regression, which is the most popular method. But there are also others like uh, ridge regression or even some neural nets. Uh, but the problem with single cells is that um, since you're starting with much less DNA, there's about six picograms of DNA in a single cell. A lot of that is degraded during the process of bisulfite conversion, which is how you get the methylome. Um, at least currently, there are methods that are being developed to do that enzymatically as well. Um, but so far, it's with bisulfite conversion. And so you lose a lot of that DNA. And what you end up with is a, a really a sparse, uh, sparse matrix. So one cell may have a couple of CPGs covered and another cell might have a completely different set of CPGs covered. And not only that, but the, the values that you get since there's only basically one read because you have one, uh, just one piece of DNA in a single cell, um, you'll have binary methylation values. So CPG will be methylated one or unmethylated zero. And so we had to kind of, um, to develop the method, we had to, to to, to create a framework that enabled us to work with this sparse binary matrices as opposed to the classical dense fractional matrices that you get with bulk samples. So, I mean, the way you've described it, so you've got a single cell and we only get a limited number of CPG sites that actually have a methyl group or not that we can actually detect. So there's basically 
there's other sites that because we lose DNA in the process of extracting it, we just won't get a measurement for that cell. So given that we use these sites to then predict epigenetic age, maybe it doesn't sound like the best thing to try and do it for a single cell. So how do we actually overcome these challenges? And what are like the major assumptions you have to make in the data? And what, how do you use the limited amount of information that you do get to actually get a relatively um, accurate prediction of an age for a single cell? Yeah, so you're exactly correct. I mean, that problem was around the first single cell methylation data sets came out in 2014. There was a group uh, in the UK, Wolf Reich, uh, in Cambridge, actually, where you are. Um, and uh, he, he was able to get the methylome, the partial methylome of a couple single cells. Um, it's not super high throughput at the moment. These methods are still basically like one cell per wall reactions. And you can get anywhere from like five to 10% of what you would get with a bulk sample. Uh, and so because of that, Ever since 2014, I guess people have been trying to figure out how to apply these clocks to single cells because we're very interested in the heterogeneity of the aging process. And that was something that was not able to be to be really analyzed um, before this. Um, and so, yeah, I guess um, there's, yeah. Could you, could you repeat like what exactly? Oh, yeah, for sure. I'm just like, <laughs> what are the major assumptions like in terms of like okay. the algorithm okay. and stuff for you to actually be able to use a limited amount of data to predict the age of a single cell? Mm -hmm. So the big assumption that we make is that uh, each CPG site in the single cell is independent of another CPG site in that same cell. Um, that assumption is most likely incorrect. I think there's a lot uh, biologically happening that links uh, methylation at different, because we know that DNA is a, very, it's a, it's a 3D structure uh, in the cell and even 4D if you include time uh, in the way it's like moving around. So I think there's a lot more interactions happening between different parts of the DNA, and it's likely that methylation somewhere has an effect on methylation somewhere else. Uh, but that's very difficult to ascertain at the moment. I think we'll need a lot more studies and a lot more methods to be able to, to understand that. And so the principal assumption that we make is that, that, that they're independent of each other. And that, that kind of lends itself into the, the probabilistic approach that we use, uh, the idea that, that we make a likelihood uh, metric based on uh, the observed methylation values and then these these training models that we make based on bulk data. I see. And so um, obviously, as you, we've already spoken about, because we got single cells, we don't get all of the CPG sites. There's like less overlap between different cells. And so does that mean when you predict the age for a single cell, the, the CPG sites that you use are different for each one? Absolutely. So that was one of the big things that we had to, because no method before that had done that. Uh, all these elastic net like tools essentially you you give it the, the methylation matrix that you have and then it, it derives you a couple cpg sites that are informative um based on the mathematics essentially and it uses those to predict age but, it, but the assumption there is that all these cpg sites that it chooses should be available in any type of, of sample that you use and if they're not you have a problem because there are coefficients associated with these cpg sites and if you don't have a methylation value to multiply by that coefficient, then something about the model um, will not be as good uh, as if you had all of those. So with single cells, there was no way, uh, at least with present methods, to do that since, as you're saying, um, and what we saw is that the very discordant reads, right? So one cell might have a particular set of CPG sites, uh, and then another cell might have a completely different one. So what we do is we create this reference data set that uh, kind of catalogs um, a fair amount of CPG sites, um, a million, uh, more than a million, if you want. You can, it's very flexible, so you can use any type of, of reference set. And the idea is that it maps how methylation changes in bulk data um, with age. So it may increase, it may decrease, it may not change. And so we use this reference data set and we selectively intersect it with a given single cell so that we only look at the CPG sites that are covered both in the single cell and in the reference data set. Um, and that's kind of how we get around the, the problem. And then further from that, we, we kind of rank them. There's another algorithm that we use um, to rank and filter them based on only the CPG sites that we're really interested in. So as, as I said, most of them are totally uninformative of age. So either they'll be unmethylated uh, the whole time or methylated um, uh, also the whole time. But what we're really interested in is are the ones that are dynamic, right? The ones that change with age. So maybe it'll be unmethylated or mostly unmethylated at young ages and then uh, gain in methylation over age or, or the opposite. 
Okay, you definitely explained that way better than I did. So yeah, that makes so much more sense now. Um, so in the paper as well, you you use single cell age in a couple of different like scenarios to show like how it's working. And so the one that I think I liked most was um you show it for like early mouse development. And you see um the kind of something I read in a review article a year ago about ground zero, how there's actually like a very early rejuvenation event going on where we see like the biological age go down. Um, in the very early stages. So, I mean, could you elaborate a bit more on that? For sure, yeah. So we looked at a couple data sets in our paper. Um, like the first figure kind of highlights how we developed the method and it's um, kind of like the, the background for, for the rest of the paper. Uh, figure two looks at this uh, really nice data set from Jan Vig, um, where they looked at liver hepatocytes. And so that was kind of our uh, proof of concept that it worked, right? Because these cells, we know that they age. You can test uh, liver and we know that epigenetically it ages. Um, and so we wanted to see the same with individual hepatocytes and it worked really well. The next one was muscle stem cells. And that was really interesting too, because uh, we found, as Wolf Reich had found previously, that the epigenetic age of old muscle stem cells is very close to the epigenetic age of young muscle stem cells. So it suggests some kind of like attenuated epigenetic aging trajectory um, in muscle stem cells. And we looked at embryonic stem cells, uh, nice results there too. And then to, to what you're getting to the embryonic rejuvenation, that was really the crux of the paper, I think. Um, my colleague Chaba published another paper in Science Advances um, earlier last year in June. Um, and that, that looked at this phenomenon at the bulk level. Uh, that's where he first found uh, empirical evidence that indeed there was some kind of rejuvenation event happening. Uh, and Bavadim, actually, the, the review article that you mentioned, he he wrote that without seeing any data. So he was really kind of a visionary. Um, I, I don't know how he came up with it. It's, uh, it's a really, really brilliant uh, way to think about it, because in, in fact, if he's right, your your sex cells are your sperm, your egg, they, they, they age with you. They're, even if the aging is reduced because they're they're um, like gametes, right? Uh, they're still metabolically active. They're still in your body. Time still passes. So they must age. But somehow they must give rise to uh, a baby, an embryo that is age zero. And that happens every generation, ever since the beginning of, of humanity, right? Um, so there's this natural rejuvenation event, uh, and we're really interested in, in characterizing it. Um, and so we did, uh, Chubb, I did it at the bulk level, and then I was able to do it at the single cell level. And what we find is that the epigenetic age, we used uh, this really great data set also from Wolf Reich, uh, Nature paper in 2019. And what we find is that from embryonic day 4.5, which is pretty early um, in the mouse, uh, in like mouse gastrulation, I guess, um, from there, the epigenetic age decreases from 4.5 all the way to 7.5, which was the last um, time point that we had. And we're at 7.5, it's basically zero, according to a couple of models that we used. So that hints that the epigenetic age uh, of the gametes is essentially reset, not at fertilization, not when they combine, but uh, sometime later, uh, really during the process of gastrulation when the different germ layers start to, to appear. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I think um, it'd be really cool to further investigate what exactly is happening in a cell <laughs> that like enables this reduction in the age. And I guess that kind of leads on to my next question, which is like, how do you foresee the application of this tool in further studies? Like, was there an opportunity to maybe combine it with like single cell transcriptomics, um, so looking at gene expression patterns or like, yeah, where, where generally do you see this single cell age being used? Yeah, so on one hand, I think it's, it's, you're totally correct. I think if we're able to understand the mechanisms that underlie this embryonic rejuvenation, that'll make a lot of headway uh, to all these other efforts that are looking at reprogramming. Because so far it's all been like Yamanaka or Yamanaka type reprogramming with the OSKM. And that's quite artificial, right? There's no, at least so far, there's very little like biological basis for why that would happen uh, naturally. Uh, but we see that it does indeed happen naturally. So if we're able to kind of dissect how that happens, it's possible we will, we'll be able to find more uh, like downstream effectors uh, and things that we're able to, to modulate and control a bit more than Yamanaka factories, which are still, um, a bit uncontrollable at the moment. Um, and in terms of where the study and where the tool can be used, I think there's a lot of potential. Uh, this is just the first single cell uh, like clock framework. There will be many others as the experimental methods improve and you start to deal less and less with this issue of sparsity. I think there will be many more methods. And even with the issue of sparsity, I think other methods can be developed too. 
Um, but I hope it's it's used in, in a lot of <laughs> in a lot of applications. So on one hand, you're right. I think like looking at multi omics is super exciting. Um, Wolf Reich was kind of the initiator of that too, uh, where you can now get the, the transcriptome, the chromatin accessibility information, and the DNA methylation in the same single cell. And you can do even more modalities now. And I mean, that was a couple of years ago. I think that's like really one of the coolest frontiers that science has ever gone to is the fact that you're able to learn so much information from a single cell. So hopefully we can create like integrative models that kind of um, that look at different modalities um, and give you a much more comprehensive uh, age prediction than just from one modality, like the epigenome from what we looked at. Uh, but even just with the epigenome, I think it'll be a useful tool uh, in a lot of applications to be able to understand how individual cells age. Um, because we know, like for example, like muscle stem cells, they show attenuated epigenetic aging, and that really wasn't um, clear before. So we think uh, cells age different, very differently in the body. So there may be some that age um, kind of like chronological and epigenetic age, like right along the middle. Some may have attenuated epigenetic aging, some um, likely age faster than the chronological age. Uh, and I think more importantly, we think that cells will have very different responses to uh, longevity or rejuvenation interventions. And so now we really have a tool to be able to, to measure that, uh, not at the bulk level, not at the tissue level, but how indeed individual cells respond to, to reprogramming or to rapamycin or caloric restriction or things like that. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. Um, yeah, there's so much you can do with it. And as well, yeah, testing different uh, therapeutic strategies um, as well to see how effective they are. I and mean, I guess as well, also, we mentioned heterogeneity like within a tissue and um, between organs, but also between individuals that, you know, yeah. it'd be interesting to see differences. So yeah, I, I foresee this being um, very popular um, in the future. And yeah, um, yeah, and congratulations again on the paper. Um, so just, what, yeah, what's, what's next for you in terms of um, your research avenues? Um, yeah, so I was, uh, I did this work in uh, Vadim Gladyshev's group at Harvard, um, really great place, highly recommend if anyone is interested, uh, Vadim is really a great mentor, really a visionary in, in the field, um, and he's got a very high integrity view, I think, of, of things, and he's, he's a really good guy, um, and I just left the lab actually last month, uh, in December, I moved to California, uh, the weather is a bit warmer here. <laughs> Um, and I joined Retro Biosciences just uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, it's, a, it's a company focused on, on reprogramming along with a couple other things based in Redwood City, California. So, yeah. Well, awesome. Um, and also, yeah, your expertise is going to be very useful for that job. So sure. best of luck with that. And congratulations sure. once more on the paper. And yeah, thank you for taking the time to really explain what exactly it was you were doing in the paper, probably definitely better than I did. Um, and yeah, hopefully, I think this has given us a nice um, broad overview of where it can also be used and the value that it's gonna bring as well. So yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This is great. So I hope you've learned something in this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.